February 13th of 2018 saw the release of Hellraiser Judgment, the 10th installment in the Hellraiser franchise. Like every new installment since Hellraiser 5 Inferno back in 2000, Hellraiser Judgment was released direct to video. What makes it controversial though, is that like the poorly received Hellraiser revelations before it, Judgment does not feature Doug Bradley as Pinhead. It was made on a minuscule budget, and it was greenlit for the purpose of extending production company dimensions hold on the Hellraiser movie rights. What is more, the fan favorite Doug Bradley has been openly critical towards both the movie and towards Dimension, the studio making it. To say that Hellraiser Judgment may be facing an uphill struggle to win fans over is something of an understatement. The movie does have one thing going for it though, namely that it is the brainchild and passion project of Gary J. Tonicliffe, an industry veteran and Hellraiser superfan who has, in different capacities, been involved with every Hellraiser movie since part 3 back in 1992. But will that be enough? Joining me to discuss that and all other things Hellraiser is Tom Connors from Midnight's Edge After Dark. Hello. As well as a very special guest with a unique insight into the subject matter. Gary J. Tonicliffe, the writer and director of Hellraiser Judgment. Good morning. Thanks a lot for joining us, Gary. I'm very happy to be here, and uh, trust me, it will be no holds barred. We won't leave any stone unturned, and uh, anyone who knows me or knows the way I speak about things, I will let you have it straight from the hip, and uh, I won't hold back in my opinions or sharing the truth, or at least the truth as I remember it and know it, and I have a pretty excellent memory of uh, all the events that have transpired on this particular movie, uh, going all the way back to... Uh, Hellraiser, Hell on Earth. So I, uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, giving you as much information as you can possibly handle. That should be good, because in this series of videos, we are going to talk about Gary's experience from the set of the original Hellraiser movies, all the ones featuring Doug Bradley as Pinhead, both the theatrical and direct-to-video ones. After that, we will explore exactly what went down behind the scenes of the universally mauled Hellraiser Revelations, a movie which Gary actually wrote. Then, we will move into the controversies and public drama surrounding the production of Hellraiser Judgment, the movie which Gary wrote and directed. Finally, we are going to review and discuss all aspects of the movie in detail. Needless to say, there will be spoilers. Before we begin though, Tom, why don't you introduce filmmaker Gary J. Tunnicliffe to the audience? Gary J. Tunnicliffe was born and raised in the small town of Burntwood in the rural county of Staffordshire, England. He was obsessed with film from an early age and started doing makeup effects in the early 80s. This landed him a job working at the famed Pinewood Studios near London. Several years later, age 25, he moved to Los Angeles and eventually started his own makeup effects company called Two Hours in the Dark, Inc., named after the average amount of time spent in a cinema. Since then, he has designed and created makeup effects for over 100 films. Among them are movies within genre franchises, including most notably Hellraiser, but also Blade, Dracula, Halloween, Candyman, Scream, Mimic, and The Exorcist, as well as standalone films like Olympus Has Fallen and Gone Girl. He has worked with directors like David Fincher, Stephen Norrington, and Wes Craven, as well as with actors like Nicolas Cage, Johnny Depp, John Travolta, Robert De Niro, Chevy Chase, James Earl Jones, and Dakota Fanning, just to name a few. He has also acted in movies like Halloween Resurrection, Feast, and Megalodon, and he both wrote and directed the films Hansel and Gretel and Jack and the Beanstalk. Today he shares his time living in Los Angeles and in Bucharest, Romania, where he has a writing and art studio. Most recently, of course, he has written and directed Hellraiser Judgment. Gary, is there anything you want to add to that? I agree with all of that. That's all true. I was <laughs> born in Burwood in Staffordshire. <laughs> Ironically enough, and this is a strange thing, but uh, Tolkien, when he wrote Lord of the Rings, it's based on uh, the Shires. He's based on the area when, where I live. So Staffordshire is one of the Shires. So I'm from Middle Earth, which is the Midlands in England, the middle of England. You know, so uh, that's where I'm from and that's where Tolkien was from. So Middle Earth, the Midlands, Staffordshire, the Shire. 
So uh, I guess I'm a, I think I'm a hobbit, maybe. So there, you go. there you go. Awesome. Not an easy place to become a film professional. If you're a young man growing up in rural Staffordshire with a father who's an electrician and a mother who's a, a restaurant manageress, aspirations of wanting to work in Hollywood are regarded as something like to want to go and live on the, on the moon. <laughs> you know, when I told my father I wanted to be an actor, his first reaction was, that's fantastic. So tomorrow you can come with me and you can act like an electrician all day long. <laughs> then when he heard I was doing makeup because I was gluing prosthetics to my sister and making my, you know, I was basically using my friends and family to do makeups. When he heard I was doing that, I think he suspected I was gay. He just said, I hear you're doing makeup now. And uh, is there anything you want to tell me? And I was like, <laughs> you know, and then when he saw the blood and the gore, he was OK with it. But it was very much an uphill battle growing up in that town and uh, trying to do something like that. It was regarded the same way as it would be if you wanted to be an actor or a singer or anything. It was it's like these are not real professions. It's not a real job. Um, so. Um, Luckily enough, I, I sent some pictures of my makeup effects to a guy called Chris Tucker, who did The Elephant Man. And uh, he gave me some work, first of all. And then when I stopped working for him, I went to Pinewood Studios and worked at Ima Image Animation, who did the effects on the first Hellraiser. Uh, and that's what got me into the industry and started my process. And it was they were really the people I wanted to work with. I wanted to work with Bob Keane, who, uh, who designed the effects on the first Hellraiser. Interesting. So that's how you got started with Hellraiser. Hellraiser was a massive influence on me from the moment I saw it. Early on, I'd, I'd watched things like Rawhead Rex and Underworld, you know? Yeah. And I was reading Clive Barker's books. I loved, loved the books of blood. And uh, this, you know, this, this new uh, writer was coming on the scene. And then I heard about this film Hellraiser and literally went and saw it and sat in the cinema. <clears throat> and my reaction was, was nothing short of uh, life changing. And I looked up at the screen and saw Pinhead and said, who did that? Where did they do it? And that's what I wanted to do. And uh, when I found out that the company had done it were in England, because I'd been looking at makeup artists in Fangoria like, you know, Rick Baker and Rob Bottin and Dick Smith, and they were the people I was aspiring to be. And I'd never heard of this guy called Bob Keane. So when I saw Hellraiser, and um, not only was it Clyde Barker, who I, whose work I loved, and then I found out they were in England, uh, I made it my mission to, uh, to to get down and try and work there, and and that was all I was about, you know, I was trying to get my work up to a standard where I could go and work, and by the time I got down to Pinewood and got to Image Animation to work with them, they, they'd completed, they'd just completed uh, Hellbound, you know, they'd done Hellbound and Nightbreed, and um, so, you know, there was rumours even back there when I started in 1990 of uh, the next Hellraiser, the next Hellraiser, and it kind of came and went and came and went, and then I'd, I'd been there two or three years when uh, when Hellraiser Hell on Earth finally came through the door. I've always had a profound uh, love of Clive's work, uh, all of it, still do, still read all of his works and love his paintings. And um, yeah, it was um, it was a mission. It really, really was. My three kind of desires and my, my bucket list uh, in 1990, had you asked the... Uh, 18, no, 19 year old me would have been to work in Los Angeles, to work with Clive Barker, and to work on a Hellraiser film. Those were my three, my three, you know, bucket list wishes. And as I'll explain to you later on, those three happened in the space of one week. Impressive. That's crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. When we started on Hell on Earth, I was a shop. One of the guys who worked in the makeup effects shop, you know, kind of like involved in, uh, you know, creating prosthetics and stuff like that. But I was just a crew member. And my job on that fundamentally was making the Lament configuration boxes or the Hellraiser boxes. But as we started the prep and got into the shoot of it and the team were picked to go out to North Carolina, which I was not one of them, um, my supervisory talents kind of came into play. And I started organizing things and being more involved in getting everything ready and making sure things were made at the right time. And when the crew went out to go and do Hell on Earth, uh, we also got the prep for Candyman. So it was decided that I would stay back in England while Bob and the team went out to North Carolina to do the shoot of Hellraiser, whilst I took care of the build and prep on Candyman. And then when everything was built and ready for Candyman, the same crew would then go from uh, North Carolina, or some of them would then go to down to Los Angeles to complete the shoot of Candyman with all of the items that I'd prepped and had sent out. So that's what happened. Uh, Hellraiser was shot, and of course I was on the phone 
how's it going? Is it good? Is it cool? Is it going to be fantastic? You know, very excited. And then the film got completed. Candyman got completed. And then I think uh, the following spring, we heard there were issues and problems and Dimension had come on board and bought the film and they wanted some reshoots. And a team had to go out there and do the reshoots. And I was basically, by that point, very much involved in, uh, I was much higher up the ladder. And it was myself and a, and a makeup artist called Steve Painter. And we went out to Los Angeles with Bob Keane and we went out for a couple of weeks shooting. So my dream has come true. I'm on a plane to Los Angeles. Uh, I'm working on a Hellraiser movie, uh, you know, and uh, I remember standing in a room doing the skin girl, the, the girl who gets sucked into the pillar. That was one of the, my first big makeups was that I did a, the makeup on that girl, that skin girl getting sucked in the pillar. And uh, I look out the window and I can see the Hollywood sign and I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy, like I'm here, you know. And then the next thing I know, I go downstairs and there's Clive. And Clive walks in and uh, introduces himself. It was kind of strange. Like, I remember, you know, almost going to go, hi, I'm Gary Tunnicliffe. And Clive just beat me to it. And he's like, hi, I'm Clive Barker. How are you? And it was like, yeah, I know exactly who you are. You know, I mean, uh, I know exactly who you are. Clive came in and started directing second unit and creature stuff. And uh, before I know it, I was performing as a creature for Clive. Clive was actually giving me direction on set. You know, so I went, it was very strange, like I say. I mean, it was a really odd week because I'm in Los Angeles, tick that box. I'm working on a Hellraiser, tick that box. I'm being directed, but I'm working with Clive Barker, tick that box. And if, if it could have got any weirder, it did. While I was doing the makeup on the skin girl, we were listening to a radio station in Los Angeles called Pirate Radio, which is no longer there. But um, they kept announcing that Michael Schenker, who's a guitarist that I adore, from a band called uh, UFO and Scorpions, uh, would be playing at the Roxy that week. And I was like, how weird, Michael Schenker's playing like down the street this week, like I've followed this guy since I was 12 years old. The day after I did the skin makeup, the girl who played the skin girl came back to visit everyone. And uh, she walked in and just said, I wanted to say thank you so much for taking care of me and looking after me and I have your present for you. And she gave me a ticket to go and see Michael Schenker. And Bob King gave me the evening off to go and see Michael Schenker. So, that night, uh, I'm in Los Angeles watching Michael Schenker whilst working on a Hellraiser film with Clive Barker. And I remember calling my girlfriend at the time and saying, I think I'm going to die in the plane on the way home. I think it's going to be a terrible plane crash. Like, I'm being set up for, like, the end of days for me, you know? Like, I have no more, I have no more dreams, no more aspirations. I've, everything's been done. What's next, you know? And, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a fantastic couple of days. It was amazing. Oh, and... And obviously, I'm, I'm, you know, putting Doug's makeup on with Steve as well, applying the pinhead makeup. So it was very, very bizarre. It was a strange, amazing time. So whilst I am not a fan of Hellraiser 3, uh, and the more years have gone by, and the, the more I dislike that film, and I can go into the reasons why later on, uh, it does have a soft spot in my heart because it afforded me so many firsts and such a a wonderful time in my life to look back and be you know 23 24 years old and uh and uh, and being in la you know working on a hellraiser with clive barker and it was fantastic it was amazing and clive was brilliant well you know everything i knew he was going to be he was funny and interesting and smart and 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 crazy and uh you know he was they were it was great times great times sounds amazing like what a week i would have been thinking when do i wake up <laughs> it was. It was literally like that. It was like, every, and like I say, when the Michael Schenker thing happened, it was, it was bizarre. It was bizarre. And, uh, very and I surreal, the yeah. It was very surreal. It was. Looking back on it, it's like you can't, you know, it's, it's, you hope you have those moments. And I've been fortunate that I've had other moments like that in my life. But uh, that definitely stands out as a, uh, as a high point at the time. Fantastic. But clearly you have issues with the movie itself. Um... As purely as a viewer, um, I look at Hellraiser 1 and 2. Obviously, 1 is just, you know, broke the mold. It came out of nowhere, and I mean, and he's, you know, to me, Hellraiser isn't a scary film. Hellraiser never has been. I don't think Clive's films, to me, are scary. They're more intriguing. Atmospheric, I think is the word. Absolutely. Gothic, Atmospheric yeah. and tone and introducing you to worlds that are different. So... Uh, you know, I never looked at Pinhead and was afraid of him. I was just intrigued. I just wanted to know more. Um, and to me, what is utterly incredible about Hellbound is that if you told me they were filmed back to back, I would absolutely believe you. Um, the tone, the feel, the mm. look, 
the everything about it feels like the two films were shot at the same time by the same director and the same team and everything else they are the closest you know part one and part two you know to me apart from something like say the godfather you know they have that much resonance and then you get to part three and to me it just takes a left turn into mtv world it's it looks different it feels different it suddenly feels very american and i know that hellraiser was clearly shot to be in america with the kind of obvious new york yankees hat you know in the uh, you know american voices now and again but i always felt it was english it had an english sensibility to it so i never believed it as being new york or somewhere like that it always felt like england and then hell on earth just doesn't feel like that and i don't like pinhead's makeup and i think the acting's a bit you know i mean tony hickox who's a very nice guy you know was not meant to be the director of that film it was supposed to be tony randall and tony had just come off the back of directing waxworks 2 and that's what it feels like it feels like if you watch waxworks 2 it's kind of got that kind of veneer to it it's a it's a direct to video kind of like you know uh, you know it just feels a bit tacked on and they change things like the Cenobites, there was never meant to be a CD head. There was never meant to be a Barbie. Mm. Those were all uh, these this pseudo Cenobite idea that came up during the shooting. And the guys in in North Carolina, the makeup effects guys, were literally going down to Walmart and buying dog collars and bits of chain to hang on and, and spraying pants black and making these Cenobite costumes up. And the masks for Barbie and for CD head were purely victims that were in the bar originally. There was a guy who had CDs in his head and a guy who'd been wrapped in barbed wire and they were just victims. And overnight they became turned into Cenobites. The only true Cenobites in that film that were ever written and prepared that we built were the JP Cenobite, the camera head Cenobite and uh, Pinhead, you know, and, um, and Joey, you know. And I mean, and at that point when we started making those, I wasn't, I wasn't a designer, you know, I wasn't that far up the rung. People like Mark Coulier and Paul Jones were d- designing, and the only thing I got involved with was the skin gloves on uh, the Terry Cenobite, the Paula Marshall character. I did the skin gloves. So if you look at the skin gloves with the wires going to the elbows, you can kind of see where I was heading towards with Angelique eventually. You know, I, I started to do this thing with Pauls and things like that. So the opera gloves were my idea. Uh, but the makeup was done by Mark Coulier, who did the makeup for Iron Lady and stuff like that later on, and as an Oscar winner and a brilliant makeup artist. But um, Paul Jones was the makeup artist who was responsible for Pinhead at the time, and also for Camerahead, which I'm I'm not a great fan of. Um, and Dave Elsie, who's a brilliant makeup artist, who then went on to do things like he did uh, Wolfman with Rick Baker. He did the J.P. Monroe Cenobite. They were the only Cenobites, so uh, you know. They suddenly were doing explosions and stuff like that, and uh, it became, I don't know, I just, I'm just not a fan. I love the stuff with Doug as, uh, as Elliot Spencer. I think that's really cool and opened it up, but I don't know. It's just that the more I go back and look at it, it just feels very bubblegum to me. Oh, yeah. There are things about it I do like. I love the Pillar of Souls, and the greatest moment for me as a, as a guy working in a shop was watching the making of the Pillar of Souls and being involved in it, but watching Paul Catlin, who's a brilliant sculptor and a brilliant designer, uh, watching him sculpt the Pillar of Souls in a couple of weeks in wet clay was phenomenal. It was just every day I would walk in and watch this piece of art that just coming out of this guy's hands. It had me, gave me such an appreciation for him. And if you look at Paul Catlin and what he's done over the years, um, there were three artists in England at the time who all lived together, who were buddies. And they were Stephen Norrington, who you probably know went on to direct Blade and stuff like that. A guy called Chris Halls, who's also known as Chris Cunningham who has done various videos and art pieces and stuff like that, and Paul Catlin. And they were all equally talented. And Paul is a brilliant designer and brilliant writer and director and a thoroughly nice guy. And uh, he was the one who created the Pillar of Souls and built it. I mean, I was in charge of getting it made and uh, making sure it was molded and we ran the pieces. And then the team out there, Dave Keane and Paul, uh, Steve Painter, and those guys assembled it. So it's got some elements, but I just think overall uh, it just doesn't have that... Uh, I think Tony Hickox is one of those guys who um, is a director who turns up and shoots the shoots what's on the page that day. I don't know how much he's in. I think he's influenced by what's going on at the time. But Tony's a very rock and roll director, you know, kind of gets in there and shoots it. And I think, and I hope this doesn't sound rude, I don't think there's a lot of subtext to the way that Tony thinks or shoots his movies. I think he shoots from the hip. 
Whereas I like movies that tend to have a subtext as a reason for everything, even the way the lighting is or uh, a prop is placed. I think Tony's more, you know, action orientated and uh, and like that. And and so I think that on subsequent viewings, Hellraiser: Hell on Earth becomes weaker as the more you watch it. So over the years, it became I, I liked it even less and even less and even less. I can totally see that, especially with the subtext, because I'm a stickler for subtext too. And when I was growing up, and I kind of liked Hellraiser 3, but as I grew up, I kind of like see the flaws more and more. Like the movie, it rests very much on the performances of Paula Marshall and Terry Farrell. And they were... well, let's not go into that, shall we? But also about this thing with subtext. The thing that always stuck out to me, because I really liked the Elliot Spencer part of that movie, but how he reached Terry Farrell's character, when he basically said that you dreamed about your father who died in Vietnam, and a dream of one war is a dream of all wars. And that's the most stupid thing I have ever heard. It's such a weak script with so little to it. Peter's a great writer. I mean, Peter, and Peter's a thoroughly lovely guy as well. Peter wrote Hellbound and and, uh, and Hell on Earth. But I suspect that Peter's original script, and then as it was tinkered with by Larry Mortoff and Larry Cuppin and Tony, uh, you know, I'm sure like every screenwriter that's ever written a script that has then been taken over by anybody, they would, you know, scream uh, to the stalls, everybody in there saying, that's not what I wrote. That isn't what I meant when I said that. And the line after it was really good, you know. So, I mean, um, I suspect that... Uh, if Peter was online with us now, he'd be like, yeah, although Peter's a lot nicer than I am. He tends to be a bit more politically correct and a bit more, uh, you know, uh, easygoing. But uh, I'm sure Peter would go, yeah, well, I'll tell you now, Gaza, that's not what I wrote. <laughs> you know, that isn't what I said, and that was somebody else's line. Again, there were people uh, sticking their oar in along the way there. There really, really were. And I know that um, I think that's why Tony Randall was ejected. I think Tony was standing up for himself and was fighting for everything and uh, had written the script with Peter. And I think uh, that's what got him uh, nixed from the project. And I suspect, and I, I, I'm i gonna go on a limb and just say I know, that I think had he directed Hell on Earth, it would have felt, it would have looked, and it would have been a sequel to Hellraiser uh, Hellbound. Going back to what you said, Gary, about Hellraiser not really being your typical horror film, or at least in the horror genre in a way, it does almost feel like the death metal version of a movie. Like it's a death metal garage band. The first film felt like to me was their first album, you know, and, and it was a little bit better with the second album. But then when you get to the third album, Andre said this, it's the MTV Hellraiser. And it is. It's like that garage death metal band sold out. And you can hear it in the music. It's just not the same. The passion's not there. It's not the same type of feel and tone and emotion. And it really pushed me off to the Hellraiser movies to where I didn't finally get back into them until there was at least another two or three on video. And then I finally came back around to them again and rewatched them all. And I'm sure that was about the time they got re-released on DVD back in the day. And it just, yeah, that movie really turned me off for a while to the series. I, I love certain aspects of it, like you said, but other than that, just the story overall and the fact that it felt so empty in comparison and just so bubblegum, like you said, I think it was, or pop, you know, it just, it did. It was that MTV Hellraiser film. It really does carry that through today. I suspect, thinking of it now, that we're sitting here talking about it, that Hellraiser, the first film, is pure because it was Clive's vision. Right. And Christopher Figg supported his vision and there was no studio involvement and uh, they literally, you know, financed this film and then got the dailies and were like, whoa, this is cool. You know, let's throw a little bit more money into this and we'll, uh, you know, upgrade it. Because the film was made for like a million bucks, but then they did go back right. and they did reshoot some stuff. Then I think they put more money into Hellbound uh, to go from there. And again, I think that was probably pretty pure. I never met Chris Figg, but I suspect that him and Clive as executive producers on the film were very had kind of good power positions and were able to say this is how it should be and there was no interference I think uh, that Hellraiser 3 probably marked the first time that the committee got involved the corporation got involved where you tend to get those and they're not horror fans and they're not horror authors they are people going you know what would be really cool is if we had Armored Saint in this and we had motorheads <laughs> of the end song. All these if they did this. And they're the moments that make every horror writer and every horror fan groan. But everybody thinks, oh, it, this is what makeup, this is what make it be good. And that's why we suddenly found ourselves, you know, me and Doug out in Florida doing MTV Spring Break with <laughs> Doug in pinhead makeup. 
And I'm not kidding, but we had, it was, and I remember it vividly. I remember being in Panama Beach with Doug, and Doug is standing next to a giant cauldron with a spoon with uh, with smoke coming out of it, saying lines like, you know, uh, whose soul is next? Bunches of teenagers go, woo, Bennett, woo, dude, you know, and then we went off and did the Tonight Show, and we walked the red carpet and stuff like this. It was like they were, what else can we stick Pinhead on? It was, uh, it, and like, I, I think it was very much, um, how do we sell it? That's the first time that we got the execs involved and people like that. And uh, that's where, where it becomes a, a real tricky process for every filmmaker, I think, of, of balancing your dealings with um, executives, studio. No one owned, you know, they were trying to get the movie distributed. They were trying to get someone to buy it. So they had Doug in makeup in the pillar doing lines like Bob Weinstein of Dimension Films. Are you ready for hell? You know, and they <laughs> recorded things like that. And different studio executives, Bob Shea, I hate Freddy, you know, bring me to your studio. Doing these kind of invitation lines that they then sent out to these various executives to try and get them to buy the franchise. Just to clarify to those watching, the movie was actually made by the production company that rose from the ashes of New World Cinema. Transatlantic Pictures, I believe it was? It was Larry Cohen and Larry Mortoff. Right, they would be the people in charge, and while Hellraiser 3 was still in post-production, they started looking for a US distributor. And in the end, Miramax were the ones that bought it, through their Dimension label. Yes, they purchased the movie in post, and that's when they, uh, in Dimension, authorized the, um, the reshoots. Uh, and so the reshoots were under the banner of Dimension Films and were being headed by Andrew Rona, uh, who's now um, an executive at Silver Pictures, and Richard Potter, who has since left. Uh, but they were the two, uh, the two very powerful executives at Dimension Films. I have a question about that, because I did some research online, and there I have found some dispute about who is to take credit for the reshoots, because Clive Barker claims that many of the things that happened in the reshoots was his ideas, because he also didn't come in until like this time. The movie was made largely without his influence, and then he came in in post-production. And then, according to him, he was the one that suggested, for instance, the skinned girl being taken into the Pillar of Souls, and how, towards the end, with the confrontation, between Pinhead and Elliot Spencer, how then you have Terry Farrell's character in the background being strung up and leather-bound. Whereas Bob Weinstein claimed that these were his ideas. Do you know who is in the right here? Uh, Clive was very involved. I was privileged to go to a dinner, uh, you know, with myself and Clive and Bob and various people, and Clive was laying out where he thought they should be done and everything else. So I think what Bob wanted more than anything else uh, and this is where I first heard the phrase, and it became a mantra over the years with Dimension Films and me working with them, was uh, trailer shots. I want trailer shots. So Bob was all about those moments that would sell the trailer. And that's when I think Bob really came up with a lot of the ideas for the boiler room. And that's what we were doing. We were doing a lot of boiler room kills. And uh, so um, I think, look, I think if you look at it, you can probably tell if it's weird, strange and creepy, it was Clive. And if it was kind of like action orientated and it was, uh, you know, reshot, it was Bob. So uh, I would say that Bob probably got a list of his shots and Clive uh, was there for, you know, skinned woman and um, and weird penis creature coming at the ground. So a <laughs> bit of both. But uh, Clive was definitely there. It's not like, you know, like when I did Feast and Wes Craven produced it, I, I never saw Wes. Wes was never on set. He didn't turn up. He came in one day, you know, so Wes wasn't there, you know, but he was there in name only. But Clive on the reshoots of Hellraiser 3 was there many, many days. He was a lot more hands-on than he was on, uh, on Bloodline because he had other things to do. So we finished Hellraiser Hell on Earth. I did a bunch of stuff in between and then we decided to open a company in Los Angeles. I, I come out to LA and I'm working on various projects and then I hear that Bloodline is being made, Hellraiser Bloodline, and I get to hear that they've chosen Kevin Yeager, makeup effects artist extraordinaire, to direct Hellraiser Bloodline. And of course, my reaction immediately is, well, that, that's the end of that. There we go. I'm obviously not gonna be doing Hellraiser Bloodline. Clearly, Kevin Yeager, who has a much bigger studio than me and has got all these credits and he's got his own studio, clearly he will be doing the makeup effects on Hellraiser Bloodline. Um, but surprisingly enough, I get a phone call from Kevin's people 
and they say, will you come in and have a meeting? And Kevin wants to meet you and he wants you to bring his own portfolio with you, not your company's portfolio. He wants to see your work. And I went in and I had a fairly intense meeting with Kevin, um, intense because obviously I knew Kevin's work and was kind of a fan. And uh, he said, look, you know, I, uh, I, I want some kind of continuity between the uh, previous effects and, uh, and the new film. And I think that's important to get you involved. So he said, I would like to do some effects myself, but I would obviously like you to take care of Pinhead and the Cenobites. And really, he gave me the bulk of the work. Hours in the makeup chair while 138 pins are stuck in your head. Hot, uncomfortable costumes, not to mention all the evil that you must do. How do they ever relax? For Doug Bradley, who plays horror legend Pinhead in the Hellraiser films, a little game of football is all the release he needs. Pairing up with his makeup artist, Gary Tunnicliffe, Pinhead makes his point as the quarterback from hell. Around the same time, the Lord of Illusions was kicking off as well, and I was having meetings for that as well with Clive and with Bob Keane. Bob Keane was coming over for meetings as well, and that was in the early stages of development. And pretty much at the same time, both films kind of went into production. Initially, I was going to be doing more on uh, Lord of Illusions, which was fine by me because I really liked the script for it. Um, but Clive eventually said, look, I need you to take care of Hellraiser. I'd, I'd like you to take care of Hellraiser and, and uh, make sure it, it looks good. And, you know, you'll do a couple of little things on uh, Lord of Illusions. But he ended up bringing in people like Tony Gardner and Steve Johnson and, uh, you know, a couple of effects companies, which we all had meetings about. But I was really saddled with uh, Hellraiser. And thus the madness began. He kind of handed you that torch, so to speak, I guess, in a way. He did. And Bob Keane, uh, bless him, Bob was like, look, I'm Hellraiser out. Clearly, you love this thing. Clearly, you love Hellraiser. And clearly, you have a real bug up your ass about it. And uh, Bob, who's a lovely, lovely guy, and I owe him a great deal of many things. He was just like, look, you're obviously a fan. Obviously, you like it. Me, I'm done. You know, I did the first one. I did the second one. Uh, you know, I, I did the third, and, uh, and I've, I've had enough of it. I don't know what you... Bob's a really nice, kind of wholesome guy, which is right. kind of strange because he has a wicked sense of humor. But I think he was just not into what I saw about, what I got from it. And he was like, look, you obviously love it. Go for it. Have fun. Knock yourself out. Onwards and upwards. So now um, you're basically the ambassador. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He did. He was like, you know, it's all you. And uh, so I, I took over for, you know, in full effect. I mean, I was designing all the Cenobites and applying everything and uh, it was we were up and running and and I made a very very strong will decision straight away that I was going to be very uh, adamant about making Pinhead look like he did in the first film I thought he didn't look right in the third film his costume looked weak his makeup looked strange so I went back and uh, you know really uh, made the costume look as good as it could possibly be we got Jane Wild Goose involved who did the costume on the first film which was very tricky from Los Angeles, um, and made sure the makeup looked like him and really spent some time trying to get it right. But very quickly that film got into problems. It really, really did. I mean, the script was amazing. It was a great script that Peter had written, uh, full of all sorts of uh, really cool stuff. And the three timelines was wonderful, and clearly they had some money behind it. Um, but quickly it got into problems. Um, fundamentally for me, the biggest problem, first of all, was that, uh, Kevin Yeager, um, very early on, I was worried about Kevin because, uh, he seemed to be a very kind of nice guy. Like he had a very young daughter and she would come and visit on set and she'd kind of be bouncing on his lap and playing and all smiles. And Kevin was like a young father. And, uh, I just thought, I don't know if you're the right guy to be helming this kind of material, you know, like I think there's a taboo to this material that needs a dark presence or someone with a dark, some darkness to their soul a little bit. And a lot of the people that Kevin had brought on board from stuff he had directed, which was mainly Tales from the Crypts, um, you know, um, he shoots the, he used to shoot the opening sequences for Tales from the Crypt with the, the Crypt Keeper. And he'd done an episode of Crypt, of the Crypt Keeper, of Tales from the Crypt, which is very TV. And he brought in a DP who was known for doing more kind of like family films and stuff like that. And, you know, so when we saw the dailies, it looked really overlit to me. And uh, it didn't look like a horror film. It looked like something else. Kevin wasn't really getting his fingers in the filth and shooting anything nasty. It just it all felt a bit tepid. And the DP was slow. I think he was used to doing big films. And I think a lot of the crew he'd brought on were TV people. So when it started becoming nights and long hours and and a real kind of like in the trenches horror film a lot of them just bailed on him 
uh, and just bailed out and said, oh, this is too much work for me. I'm not going to do it. And Kevin, rather than fessing up to the bad dis- mis- the bad decisions he'd made in terms of production designer, in terms of the DP, uh, he chose to be very, uh, a little bit arrogant, I thought. Uh, especially to Bob Weinstein, I think he was a bit, I think Kevin comes from a place where Kevin at a very young age had become a millionaire uh, and was used to being kind of a hotshot makeup effects guy, you know, from doing Chucky and doing Guitars from the Crypt. And he carries that with him. He's, uh, he's very aloof. And I think rather than being, I think when he got pulled up in front of Bob Weinstein, who was probably a little bit like, I'm not happy with what I see, I think rather than bowing his head and saying, okay, I'm really sorry, you're right, this didn't work out, help me, Bob, help me to make a better film, I think he kind of threw it in their face a little bit and was a bit like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, how dare you talk to me like that? And I think that is a very foolish fight to take up, especially with someone like Bob Weinstein. I think you have to know your place with Bob. People have asked me over the years, I've said, you know, how, how is it that you've worked a long time with Dimension and you've managed to uh, keep going back? And I've always equated it to being a lion tamer in a circus, that every time you do a, a performance, you put your head inside the lion's mouth. And uh, if you for one second think that the lion isn't going to try and bite your head off one night, you're a fucking idiot. Right. You know, you have to know that. So you do everything you can to make sure that the lion's well fed before you go in. And if you one night forget to feed the lion, you're going to die. So uh, I, you know, and maybe you would say, oh, you're pandering or, oh, you're being subservient. It's like, look, it's, it's Bob's company. He owns it. He's in charge. He's the boss. So if he says that he wants more blood or he wants less blood, then, you know, I don't hold the pink slip. You know what I mean? He holds the pink slip. So after all of the shooting that happened on, uh, on Hellraiser, I think it came down to a situation where Bob turned around to Kevin and said, right, show me some footage. And Kevin's a DGA, a Directors Guild director. And there is a contingent in the Directors Guild where you're allowed either 10 or 12 weeks of editing without showing any footage to a studio. That is a rule, you know, you can say. DGA rule is that I don't have to show you anything. Right. Now, most directors that I know or directors who are good at manipulating studios, what you usually do and what I always do is as soon as you finish, you cut a trailer or cut a scene as best you can with some temp sound effects and some temp music and you deliver it to the studio as fast as you possibly can so that they see it and go, wow, this looks really good. You know, this looks fantastic. This is what we're going to get. Great. Leave them alone and let them do their thing. And I think, stroke, no, that Kevin dug his heels in and said, fuck you, you don't get to do anything for 12 weeks. I'll show you when I'm ready. And once you do that to someone like Bob Weinstein, I think Bob's attitude is going to be, okay, have your 12 weeks. And at the end of it, you're gone, whether I like it or not. Yeah, that sounds like playing with fire. It is. It's absolutely like playing with fire. And I spoke to Kevin about it, and it was just like, you know, and even people at the executives were like, yeah, we don't really know what he's playing at, you know. And I mean, and I think he went toe to toe in a screaming match with Bob. He went toe to toe. I know he went toe to toe with him. You know, I heard about it. I heard it from Kevin. I heard it from the execs at Miramax. He'd gone toe to toe. And it's like, I was like, I've always been taught, you know, I mean, I come from a fighting background. You know, I, I do martial arts. I only go to fists when I know I've got a chance of winning. I'm not going to pick a fight with someone I can't win. You know what I mean? It's foolish. Yeah, you can stand it. Yeah, you can give your best opinion. and But don't pick a fight, you know. I'm not going to go and swim with a white shark. You know, it's like, it's not going to happen. <laughs> You know, I've, you know, I've got to even the odds out. So, I mean, uh, what I learned from Hellraiser Bloodline was how not to deal with the studio unless you want to absolutely get kicked off. I, say, I can really see now, and it, you shine a lot of light, pun intended, I guess, especially with the lighting. A lot of the things you were explaining are very present in the film. And what's sad is this movie is my favorite, insert your favorite slasher person here in space movie. I actually do enjoy Bloodline quite a bit because I've seen inside that movie what it could have been more so than what it actually is. So it's really, I, I'm really, it upsets me to hear a lot of this stuff because it's like, damn, this movie could have been really good. And now and it just sounds like it was more ego getting in the way than anything. What's really frustrating, Tom, is that when the film came out, 
is that uh, obviously there was a lot of people up in arms and they were like, how dare they do this to Kevin Yeager? It's a terrible situation. He's been, you know, abused by the studio and all this. Kind of like what happened with Schrader on uh, when I was involved in Exorcist with Rennie Harlan. Right. Is that all the fans came out and said, how dare they? Clearly Kevin Yeager was making a brilliant film uh, and studio know nothing. And, uh, you know, obviously all of that great opening footage from 17th century, that's, cl- that's Kevin's work. And, uh, you know, uh, they should have just let him do his thing. And then for me to be able to say, okay, let me show you what exists of what Kevin Yeager filmed. What Kevin shot that's in the film now is predominantly the middle section of him, the architecture scenes where he's like in the building with the architects and and that stuff. And to me, what is the weakest stuff? The opening scene, which I think is very good, was Joe Chappelle. Uh, the finale, it's, there is very little, there's probably like 15, 20 minutes footage of Kevin Yeager stuff in there. And it wasn't great, especially that stuff in the modern day LA stuff with him meeting her and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was, you know, it was not the best stuff. And Joe Chappelle, and I'm not a great fan of Halloween part six, which is where Joe came from. But Joe brought along a brilliant DP and I can't remember his name, Tony somebody, but he was a young uh, New Yorker kind of guy. And he had some brilliant ideas. And uh, I'm sure Doug Bradley would agree to this that he was instrumental in shooting some very cool stuff and all i know is that we finished bloodline and then about i almost didn't end up being on the film what's really strange is that there was such a debacle after bloodline after this kevin yeager meltdown that when they came to do reshoots um bob weinstein was like i don't want anybody back who was involved in that fucking film i don't want anybody back anyone that kevin yeager was involved in i do not want them back but the production company involved that were tasked with doing the reshoots said look you know we need to bring back the guy who did pinhead because pinhead's in it so when we came back i just got called to do pinhead and some effects with him and another company was doing uh, some stuff with angelique uh, not not angelique Cenobite, but the birth of angelique and luckily for me and i won't mention the company because they're very very good friends of mine and they're nice people but luckily they fucked up they screwed up on set or they either did, they either fucked up or i was doing i was on my game that week because everything I prepped looked good. Everything I did worked. Uh, and all my stuff happened to look really, really flawless. And I think when they finished the two weeks of reshoots and then decided about two months later to go back and do another two weeks of reshoots, they were like, you know what? Don't bring back the other guys. Let's bring back Gary Tunnicliffe. And those guys were Joel Swasson and Ron Schmidt and uh, and Keith Border, who own Neo Motion. And if you look at my credits, I did 20 films with those guys over the next... 10 years you know what i mean they did the draculas they did the mimic sequels they did the prophecy sequels the hellraiser sequels so that established my relationship with those guys thank god for small blessings yeah but we ended up doing i mean it was really funny because mike regan who's been my uh worked with me for many many years and it's chatterer in the subsequent films he worked on bloodline and then i went off and did a year of ghostwriting uh for somebody um and he went off and did Nutty Professor with Kevin with Rick Baker. And when he came back a year later, the first thing he was doing was Bloodline again. And he said, we're back a year later and we're still doing Bloodline. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, it's it's part three of the reshoots. And we ended up doing, I mean, Hellraiser, wow. Hellraiser Bloodline was a, th- a six-week shoot. And then we did two weeks of reshoots, two weeks of reshoots, and two weeks of reshoots. So we ended up shooting the, you know, almost the same. Uh, shooting the entire movie almost, it was yeah. Crazy! It was crazy, and the stuff that's in the film that didn't make it, the stuff that's not in the film, but, uh, you know, we were shooting stuff pinned in space, you know, falling apart and kind of like melting down. We had a, you know, Bruce Ramsey had to wear a special prosthetic because he wouldn't shave his head again, obviously. And we did the Gamblers, which never ended up in the film. And there was so much stuff, but. Um, Eventually, you know, the film came out and uh, Kevin obviously didn't get a credit and I'm sure I've worked with Kevin since I did Sleepy Hollow with Kevin and Kevin is one of those people who has taken all of the bad of it and made it right in his own mind that he was the complete victim and never did a thing wrong (laughs) to the point that if you even mention Hellraiser in his presence, he locks up, glares at you and he's like, don't, don't you talk to me about that fucking movie. Like, you know, like, they fucked me over, they screwed me over, I was never in the wrong, and I think, just like most people do, the more they live with it on their own and it, it uh, you know, percolates, it becomes a very one-sided, I was right, you're wrong 
story. So that I remember on Sleepy Hollow one time, someone mentioning it and me saying, and he was like, this happened and this happened. And I said, oh, that's not technically what happened. But Kevin, I was there. And he was like, he was just venomous. You could see the venom coming out of his eye. It's like, you know, that's fuck you, you know, like, and I think he got a very warped sense of what was the reality of it uh, by that point. Similar to what's happened with Doug Bradley, I think, in recent years. And we'll get into that more and more later on. Right. But unfortunately, it soured my relationship with Kevin. You know, I remember it as it was. I mean, look, I have a pretty bloody good memory of these things. And I remember the good and the bad, uh, you know. And unfortunately, I was there on the sidelines of the whole thing. And so when Bloodline came out, um, it was a mixed bag. And it's a shame because, yeah, I think anybody who watches that film looks at it and thinks, oh, what if, you know. Right. Oh, this is the film that could have been. And they spent, they spent, they were willing to spend money on it. You know, and right. it was theatrical and they were willing to go for it. And I mean, and I'd built up such a good relationship by the end of that movie that I'd been tinkering around with an idea called Hellraiser the Holy War. Uh, and I had a pitch, which was, what if we did, I got this opening sequence and I storyboard it and everything, but the sequence was basically pre-credit sequence where you see a guy searching for a box he's kind of like you're searching he's in antique stores and he's he's rummaging around and then you see him on the streets of london and maybe he's in tibet and he's kind of like backpacking and all this stuff and clearly you get the idea that he's looking for something and then he ends up kind of almost in that sequence at the very beginning of uh, hellraiser one where you see frank bargaining for the box and you see this guy get the box and he gets it and he's running home and he's nervously traveling the streets and he gets to a, a little shanty room run down and there's a and he makes the candles in a square and you realize he's got the box and then he takes his jacket off and he's wearing a priest's collar and you re and he basically explains you understand that he believes that only through perpetual suffering can you truly be entered into the kingdom of god you know it's like flagellation it's like this will get me into heaven by suffering for my love of, of the lord and that was the pitch. And I went to Jeff Kurz, who was an executive at the time, and pitched it to him. And he's like, wow, this is really, really cool. Let's go to Bob with it. You know what I mean? And uh, we set up a meeting for Bob. And that weekend, Scream came out. And Scream did massive box office success. And I went for my meeting with Bob, and it got cancelled at the last minute. Bob was still in New York. And then I tried to rearrange it. And basically, Jeff came to me and said, you know what? Scream is the movie of the day. I don't think they're interested in doing anything with Hellraiser for a while. Hmm. Because, and this has been the problem down the line and will be the problem, Hellraiser is a very difficult movie to turn into a sellable franchise. It contains a lot of elements that are, you know, it's not a slasher film. It's not a guy with bl blades on his fingers and teenagers. It's a weird, sadomasochistic, strange movie that's got some very weird you know imagery in it and some weird context and some weird subtext and a lot of those things they're not very comfortable with you know i think they've been trying to find a way to to make it into a sellable commodity and that's the problem we've had over the years is that they don't really know how to make it fit without keeping the elements that the fans love but it's not a big seller to the masses um, so when Scream happened and was a big success and was a very, very easy model, oh, this works, guy in a mask, bunch of teenagers, they were like, yeah, forget that Hellraiser thing. So for the first time in my uh, association with Hellraiser, Scream put the block on me, you know, being involved in the next film. And I didn't hear anything for, you know, I went off and did Sleepy Hollow in London, got a new workshop, did Blade, did Twin Falls Ido, got back. The phone rang and it was Ron Schmidt and Neo and he said, hey Gary, we're doing Hellraiser in part five. Do you want to be involved? Um, you know, I'm like the Martha Stewart of Hell. What did you do with the map, Gary? I shit my pants. <laughs> I shit your pants too. This was um, actually a low point, I have to say. Um, not because the script, I read the script, really liked the script, I thought it was really, really different. I just thought it was really, really cool. And then I heard Craig Sheffield was going to be in it, which was really exciting because um, uh, there's a link to Craig from, uh, you know, through Hellraiser, through Nightbreed and stuff like that. But the hardest thing for me was the fact that they called me and said, we're doing Hellraiser Inferno. And I knew the producers pretty well at this point. And they said, uh, we need you on Hellraiser Inferno. Do you want to do it? It's $50,000 all in. 
on set work and all the creature effects uh, and that's all we have and I was like uh, yes no matter what I'll do it and um, I gave the information to uh, uh, Claire who used to run my office with me and I did the listing of what we needed in terms of crew and how long we need to prep and what we needed to build because it was quite a lot of stuff there was a lot of stuff to build and um, she went off and crunched the numbers and I was in the workshop preparing something and she walked up to me and she said we, we can't afford to do this film and I said what do you mean she said we, we can't you know there's no way to do this you know there's not enough money in the in the film and I I said okay and I, I called up Ron Schmidt and they were like no $50,000 if you don't want to do it we'll find somebody else but this is the budget for the makeup effects and I turned to Claire and I said well I guess I I'm not going to get paid on it and she said what are you talking about and I said I, I'm I'm not going to get paid and she said, you can't, you can't do that. And I said, well, I'm going to make a decision here. We're going to do it. And she said, why? And I said, well, I desperately want to get back in, in bed with Dimension and with Neo. Uh, and I think it's worth doing. You know, we'll, we'll do it. Every penny I got went to paying the crew. And I ended up on that film doing the longest stint I've ever done with no sleep. I did, uh, I did almost 90 hours with no sleep. Um, we had a big problem with one of the effects. And somebody let me down in my crew. And I couldn't pay them any overtime and I'd done one all-nighter and then I had to do another all-nighter and it turned into three days of doing working through the nights and going to set and um, I've never been so exhausted in my life I mean I was uh, I was hallucinating and everything but um the only joy was that we finished it we finished Inferno and then I got a call and I said look we've got this film called Dracula 2000 and we have money on that and we'd like you to meet the director and that started my relationship with Patrick Lucio which is a fantastic relationship but Inferno was uh, was very tricky and um, there was a lot of work I mean it was Pinhead it was the um, the two twins which were very difficult and I kind of made a rod for my own back by designing the characters which were full body and everything else um, torso Cenobite uh, you know, and then all of the other effects. There was, you know, the faceless killer, which was a very tricky mask to build. There was the fingers. There was the, the back effect. There was there was all sorts of little gags in there we had to do as well. So, it just became a, a lot of work. But I uh, I really enjoyed working with Scott. He was great, and uh, and and I've always had a really strong feeling about the project that I thought it was really well made and really uh, great. I love James Remar. Big fan of James Remar. So seeing him involved, but. The, this, when you think about the effects in that, you don't think about a lot of stuff. But then when you watch it, you go, "Oh my God, there is a lot of stuff in it." There's an arm breaking, a, a frozen arm on a torture pillar, and a gag here and a gag there, and those things all have to be built and made. Uh, one of the hardest things, you know, was I was involved in building props as well. So to do that finger in the candle was really hard to get the candle to the light to pass through the candle to read the finger. And making that chair that the child sat in so that his real hands would go inside the arms of the chair, but then his feet, so that the arms, the fingers were fake. It was really tricky. Um, and I love what Scott did. The only thing I didn't like about that film I really had a problem with was the blue lighting that the DP did was way too bright. There was too much light on, on Doug, on Pinhead's face. Um, he's really overlit. It's like a very ice cold blue light and there's no shadows and... Uh, I, I felt it was overlit, but um, but I, I like that film, and I have to tell you something. I mean, people can condemn that film all they like, but um, um, actors, but Craig Sheffer, man, that guy turned up to work and he put himself through it. And uh, there are several scenes where Craig's really delivering the goods, and um, he was there, he was he was in it, and really put himself in the character and uh, did a great job it always upsets me when people are quick to condemn actors and say oh that guy sucks and da 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 da, da. but if i was doing a film i'd uh, you know i'd i'd Craig I, Sheffer, I really would you get that guy on your team and if he's in the right zone he'll he'll work really really hard personally i think inferno is among the best movies in the entire hellraiser franchise it is certainly the most accessible to those who've never seen a hellraiser movie before no, it doesn't have too many Hellraiser tropes, but it must have done something right, because it set first-time director Scott Derrickson on the career path which would lead to, among other things, Doctor Strange for Marvel Studios. Among Hellraiser fans, though, that movie remains very controversial. Doug Bradley certainly doesn't like it. Why do you think that is? I think out in the uh, out in the uh, the ethos of fans and, and watching, and maybe I'm wrong here. But there does tend to be a lot of uh, a lot of sheep following, you know what I mean? 
And that is the first film that uh, Clive and Scott got into it, you know, online. There was a big, a big thing where basically, I think Clive turned around and said, I don't like it. Uh, and Scott turned around and said, you just don't like it because I made a better film than you ever made. <laughs> and that went down like, like a bomb. And then Doug came out and said he hated it. And I think a lot of fans are like, you know, yeah, we don't like it either. You know, there's a lot of people who were, uh, you know, I mean, Doug's always funny. Like, I've, I've several times, you know, over the years, I would go and meet Doug and uh, he'd say, oh, you know, fans told me they, they hate this or they love that, you know, and, uh, you know, like, uh, and I'd say, well, fans are only ever going to say that to you, Doug. No fan is going to walk up to you and tell you the things that they like about somebody else. It's, you know, I wouldn't walk up to David Lee Roth and say, hey, David, I love Sammy Hagar. It's like, what would be the point? It would go down like a, like a, a fucking lead balloon, you know. Um, Unless you're trying to be a dick, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I mean? It's like if you're going to meet somebody and and be and want them to, you know, most people want the person they're meeting to be nice to them. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna fan them. So if you look at Doug's favorite Hellraiser film uh, after the first couple, his favorite film's Hell on Earth. Why? Because it's the one he's in the most. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He likes it because it's got lots of him in it. Probably you know? got paid like, the most too. <laughs> at the end of the day, Doug's an actor. You know what I mean? And let's never forget, you know, it was an actor who killed Lincoln. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's a reason why people get on stage and say, look at me. It's because they want the world to look at them. So Doug loves Hell on Earth. And he would sit there and regale me all the time about why Hell on Earth's brilliant and how Inferno's not. You're not in Inferno very much, are you, Doug? You know what I mean? Oh, it's, you know, if it would have had more Doug in it, I'm sure he'd like it a lot more. It'd be higher up on his, on his radar. And I think once Doug said he didn't like it, and once Clive had this falling out with Scott, everybody turned on the film and said, oh, it's terrible, you know? But, I mean, I, I tend to look at everything with very kind of like, uh, you know, everything I look at, I try not to let the the mass opinion affect me, which is not easy, obviously. You know, you hear the stories and, you know, you want to get involved. But, you know, I try to watch everything with an open mind. And I, and I do that with all the Hellraisers even now. You know, I don't I don't list my favorite Hellraiser movies and put judgment at number one. <laughs> you know what I mean? It would be idiotic. You know, you have to have a little sense of, uh, of you know, of, of, you know, of uh, perspective. Look, I'm, I'm no great filmmaker. And I'm sure people, when they hear that, will say, oh, I'm glad you said that, Gary. I'm glad you clarified that. But I mean, what I've learned about watching films over the years is that the mark of a good film to me is one that you can go back and watch again and again and again. And it improves, you know, like I remember seeing 300 in the theaters and coming out and going, oh, that was kind of fun. And then as I went back and watched it more and more and more going, this film's really not very good. You know, like it's kind of bad, you know, and kind of like, you know, it just it doesn't have a lot of substance to it. Whereas, you know, when I used to watch Kubrick movies, the first time I would see a Kubrick movie, inevitably I'd watch it and go, I fucking hated that. I don't know what all the fuss was about. People say this is a great movie. It sucks. And then when I saw it the second time, I'd go, oh, it's not so bad. Like Full Metal Jacket or The Shining or something. And then the third time I'd watch it, I'd go, it's actually pretty good, this film is. And then by the fourth and fifth, I'd go, this film's fucking amazing, actually. She's really <laughs> clever. And then 10th, 12th, 15th time, you know, like Blade Runner. It just gets better and better and better the more you watch it. And I think that shows in your work in a way, too. And we'll get to that here shortly. So... Obviously, Hellraiser Inferno then comes out, and in the defense of the Hellraiser films, some people do take you know offense to the fact that a lot of the films in this era were other scripts that were reformatted to a Hellraiser film, and that's not new or well, unique me, to Hellraiser. Play, yeah, Even films like Die Hard 2, 3, and so on were the same way. They were reformatted to be something they weren't originally, but yes, go ahead. Sorry, Gary. Let me play devil's advocate advocate to that one for one second. What I would say is, credit where credit's due, they didn't just take the same premise and recycle it over and over and over again for 10 movies. At least they were right. like, well, let's try something different. You know, and if this film is pretty good without it, then maybe with it will be good. I mean, there is an understanding somewhere down the line. I mean, it's easy to kind of cast you off and say, oh, what a terrible idea. Like, they've just shoehorned it in there. And I think as a flippant statement, it would be, it's easy to disregard it, but as an exec, you would go, look, we bought this fucking script here, and it's pretty fucking good, but you know what? Maybe with a little sprinkling of Hellraiser, it might make it even better, and it would really be kind of different, like it's a different idea. 
So there is a, you know, I've come to kind of appreciate, at least I didn't say, look, well, look, just, let's just do the same thing as we did in the other one. We'll do the same thing over and over and over again, which is kind of what happened with Nightmare on Elm Street or something else. It's like, you know, well, certainly with, uh, you know, Friday the 13th. Right. At least they were doing something a bit fucking different. And it's like, oh, yeah. I, you know, it didn't work. But like we've spoken about before, I've spoken to other people. Filmmaking's not a fucking science. I've worked on 100 movies, you know what I mean? And there have been ones that I've worked on that I go, this is going to be great. It's amazing on set every day. And then it's shit. And ones that I've worked on and been like, this is fucking garbage. And then watch the editing gone, Jesus, that was actually really quite good. Oh, yeah. There's you know? a lot of famous stories like that for sure. If there was a hit making process that we all knew, then everyone would be making hit fucking movies. You know, it's a really difficult. It's There is something weirdly, bizarrely magical that happens from script inception to making the movie to the edit you know like i mean personally the biggest travesty for me after direct after editing my first film and i wish i could go back in a way and i don't know what your experiences are guys whether you edit or not or you've edited films but if you edit a film and then you go back with editor's eyes and watch jaws it ruins the greatest movie you've ever loved i adored jaws i thought it was the greatest film ever made and then i edited a film and then i sat there and watched it again and went oh my god this film's frankenstein it's completely hodgepodge together, you know, and normal non-filmmakers don't really see it. But if you sit there with a non-filmmaker and say, have you ever noticed how these characters aren't speaking? Or when we're on their dialogue, it's on the other person listening to the dialogue. This film's completely put together in the in post. It's, 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 a, it's bizarre. It's like, oh my God, it's, it's, it's a, it's a work of, you know, there's a reason why, uh, you know, she has a building named after a universal because she completely assembled the film and put it together out of remnants. And it's yeah, it was brilliant. Oscar winning editing. <laughs> Absolutely it is. And like I say, I never saw it. It was like somebody pulled away the magic the magic the magic thing away from me. And you speak to any editor, they go, Oh yeah, it's a complete work of it's a miracle, you know, like yeah, you know. If you watch the scene where the guys, you know, go hunting for the shark with the, the hunk of meat, not one line of dialogue is said on camera. <laughs> You know, they're in the dark in silhouettes and the mouths aren't moving. It's it's amazing. So, I mean, there is no hit making process. Right. So, I mean, I at least applaud them for trying to do something different. I mean, I sound like a company, you know, guy here, you know, I do. Um, but all I can say is that every film that I was involved in, um, they all, nobody just sat around a room and said, oh, fuck it, here we go. Let's, uh, let's just make a movie for the sake of it. And who gives a shit? They all seem to be very, very kind of like, let's make the best film we possibly can. And what I would say is regarding this whole rights issue of people going, oh, well, they only made it for the rights. The only reason anyone knows this is because the information kind of has been put out there. I suggest to you that there are many, many, many films that are made solely to retain the rights or at least made within the window that they're made because the rights are about to expire. You know, they have to be made contractually. It doesn't mean that they kind of rush them into production, but I suggest that there are, you know, big companies, Universal Studios, Warner Brothers, who literally go, well, we have to make that film in the next two years because the rights are going to expire. You know, it happens all the time. It's just not information that's kind of put out there. Like, you know, because it's really, it's not a negative. It's like, yeah, it was made to retain the rights. Lots of films are made to retain the rights. Maybe you had stole my trash cans. <laughs> trying to tell me something. You have privacy for first class, please. I'll see you in Hellraiser 6! Hellseeker, you know, I have to say, of all the films we worked on, that's the one that kind of I have the least memories of. It's very bizarre. I remember working with Ashley and getting a tingle when we had Ashley in the room and, uh, you know, kind of seeing her with chains and centibites in the background and just going, wow, this is so cool. But, um... Rick Bota, who's a really nice guy and a funny guy and a very good DP, and I'm not sure why he ended up doing three Hellraiser films. His sensibilities were very kind of Joel Peter Witkin and that kind of dark imagery. But I always found that, and I learned this really, and what was, what was valuable for me doing Judgment, was that if you're going to do weird imagery and you're going to do bizarre stuff, you can't play at it. You know, you sit a fat woman in a room and put a, a leather bondage mask on her and have a camera drift by, and it's like, eh, okay. And it seems weird to everybody on set, but in order for it to read on camera as being striking, you need the people on set to almost be throwing up. You know, when we did the scene with the cleaners, 
licking the guy and spitting, you know, into the things and pouring the liquid down his throat. We had grips leaving the set, you know, electricians. Yeah, in judgment, we're talking about now. Yeah. On judgment, yeah. They were like, dude, I, I can't be doing this. This is <laughs> fucking bizarre. And that's when I was like, oh, good, it works. Because right. it's almost like by the time you get to the film, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lose some of it. it. Like because of the medium you're in, you know, it's like, and I've witnessed this a lot. Scenes that I've been on set filming where you're crying, you're watching the performance and you're crying. When you see them later on in the edit room or projected, it just, it isn't there. So it's almost like, um, you know, you have to realize that you have to hang it out there a little bit because by the time it, the filter of the filmmaking process goes on, it's going to get reduced. So you need to overscale things a little bit. I'm not talking about performances because, you know, subtlety is the key there. But in terms of visual images, uh, it, sometimes Stephen Norrington said it best to me one time. We were talking about the scene in Blade when uh, I did the sequence. I don't know if you remember it in Blade, but where the assassins get stuck with these EDTA dots and they kind of balloon up and explode. And... Um, I did these maquettes of people kind of getting ballooned up and I did one to seven and seven they look like giant blueberry heads and Steve went start at number seven and I was like that's fucking huge dude like they're gonna go like these giant balloons and explode and he said yeah he said that's what you have to do he said do you not understand he said genius he said he said it's clever to be big he said it's ridiculous to be really big he said but it's genius to be insanely big he said, so like Pearl the Vampire, the, the vampire of the uh, archives in Blade. He said, if Pearl's just like 200 pounds, it's okay. If she's 400 pounds, it's rubbish. If she's 1,200 pounds, it's genius. And he's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's right, right? Go big or go home. Yeah, right? right. And it really is. So that's how I got. And what I learned with Rick was that Rick would go what he thought was creepy, what he thought was weird, which really wasn't that weird. Uh, so what I learned with something like Judgment and Down the Pipe was sometimes you've got to make it so big. Uh, and trust me, I got pulled back on a lot on Judgment. We'll go into that later on. But I got, I mean, there was stuff that they read and they were like, no, 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 no. You are not doing that. But I was like, look, you know, you start with this and then we can we can always edit it down later on. But we have a choice if we've got the footage, uh, you know, and what's too much, you know. And, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not a fan of rape or anything sick like that. I really don't like it. Like, you show me a film like Irreversible, and I'm like, I never want to see that movie again in my entire life. I've got no interest in it. But I've always been a fan of fantastical, weird, strange stuff, you know, like Cronenberg, like Rabbit or Shivers or, you know, like just weird stuff, you know, Lynch, David Lynch. Um, so I think Rick, he didn't hang it out there enough, and... Uh, I felt like it was trying to be a bit too clever, but it didn't really work. It was so it, I, I have barely any recall of that film at all. I mean, um, we were in Vancouver, and I mean, I just remember doing a makeup on Doug to make him look like somebody else. It became very run of the mill, uh, and Rick probably asked for my help least on that film than any, any other director. Most Hellraiser directors have always been like, Gary, can you come in and explain this? And you're going to be our Hellraiser kind of like uh, consultant. But on Hellseeker, he really had his own set of agendas and uh, he was very about the lighting and the camera setup and uh, I feel very disconnected. So, I mean, I have more memories about Deda and Hellworld. I used to sometimes get caught up in the hurry of trying to get things done for the ADs when really I should just purely work for the artistic vision of our director. That is my fault. And in the words of Toby Maguire, this is my gift and my curse. Who am I? I'm a makeup effects guy. So the next two films, though, they were filmed back to back or at the same time, were they not? Absolutely. And that was the big problem. Um, Deda was, uh, as you know, um, a script that had been kicking around in uh, L.A. for a long time and uh, is the reason why, if you look at the credits, uh, you know, Stan Winston, the effects legend, is credited on that film as an executive producer because I believe that the script originated from Stan or he owned it or someone had written it that he knew. And I think Stan was trying to get it made and it went to Dimension and sat at Dimension for a couple of years and was a, you know, was a kind of a well-known script in horror circles that this film Deader existed. Um, and I think probably would have been a very good standalone film on its own. Um, but before I knew it, uh, you know, we were basically being told we'd done two Dracula movies in Romania um, the previous year. And um, before I knew it, we were heading back to do two Hellraisers. And uh, we had all of the script for Deda. It was all labeled out and we knew exactly what it was. And I thought Deda was really pretty good. 
um, and I was very excited to be doing Deader. Hell World was almost like not a complete script, um, and we were like going out of our minds trying to know what the effects were and stuff like this, and I just thought it was pretty fucking weak. And I mean, I was like, I thought it was a good idea and an interesting script, and it embraced Romania for what it was. It used Bucharest. I enjoyed making Deader. Deader was hard work, um, but Kari Wura uh, worked really, really hard. Paul, who played, um, I've forgotten his name now, the, the, the villain, he was really great. Um, it wasn't effects heavy. I mean, it was a difficult movie because with those films, we had very little budget. So um, <clears throat> I would have to go out there with just one person. So I, I was doing all the makeups on my own. I would have to do Pinhead's makeup and then I would have to do um, all of the deaders and stuff like that. And then I would have to, you know, put a suit on. I mean, I played the Spike Cenobite and I played uh, Bound at one point. And Mike Regan, who works with me, played played uh, you know Chatterer, and it was it was just a lot of work. I mean, there were long, hard days, and then Rick was like, "Can you shoot second unit for me as well?" So I was doing a lot of insert photography and uh, doing all of the kill and the hooks going through the walls and stuff like that. So those films, you're really kind of in the trenches making it and uh, getting in there and uh, hoping that it comes out good. But I tend to go off the um, uh, you know some of the dramatic scenes that we were filming and, and thinking this is really good, you know. Um, the girl who played Marla was really good, and we had that great station set to use. And when we did the train, I thought it was kind of a little bit midnight meat train, and that excited me. So it was all great. I mean, and then we we did Deader, and then it was like two weeks we had to get ready and turn Hell World around. And this was the one time I got I got pulled into story meetings and people just sitting around trying to come up with endings and come up with sequences, and it was all being done on the fly. And I remember thinking at the time, going, guys, why are we, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to do surgery in the field here. You know, a bunch of people sitting around a, a table in a hotel doing, well, what if, what if, what if? And so many times people would suggest stuff, and I'd go, you can't do that in a Hellraiser movie, guys, because that doesn't work. And they go, well, it's not Hellraiser, it's Hell World. You know, it's the game. And I'd go, yeah, but it doesn't follow the mythology. And um, I don't know. That's why I hate that movie. Like, it's my least favorite Hellraiser movie of all time. Those two movies, they were filmed in 2003, right? Yep. Yes, and then they were released within three months of each other in 2005. Yeah. Do you, do you know why they were sat on the shelves for that long and then they were just dumped like that? Um, I, think, I think at that time Dimension, uh, were, Dimension were making product, just like Blumhouse, you know, Blumhouse I don't know if you know this, but Blumhouse make a lot of films, you know, they uh, they have a vault of, of a lot of films. Oh, yeah. And I think they make these films and then they kind of just, it's like stock and we can just release them when we choose fit and as and when. Um, there's no great kind of like secret or master plan to it. I just think it's like, right, what do we have in stock and how can we release it? So, oh yeah, it's been a while since that came out. Let's let's drop another on the, uh, on the market. Um, I don't know. These are the things I'm not privy to. I mean, um, it's you know, it's like all that stuff about rights and uh, you know who owns this and who owns that and where did it come from. As a makeup effects guy, you know, my introduction to any project is I get a call from a producer or from a director saying, "Hey, we have a script. We're looking to shoot it here. We've got the money. Can you read the script and give us a breakdown of the effects? You know, and uh, you know, would you like to do it?" Uh, and invariably, you know, you call back and say. I read your script and they go, do you like it? And you lie and go, oh yeah, I love it, dude. Oh, it's fucking great. It's the most original thing I've ever read in my entire life. You know, I, I you know, this is amazing, whether it is or not, because you want to work on it, because you want the, you want the job. You know what I mean? Um, but with Hellraiser, I've always been a bit more vestly interested, and I have been pulled into rooms with producers who've gone, no, really, what do you think of it? Do you really like it? Uh, and then usually when I've given my opinion, they've gone, oh well, it's very interesting, but there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? When I have gone, yeah, it doesn't really work, or I'm not sure about this, you know, they're going, yeah, well, well that's what we've got to make. And that was very much the case with Hellworld. Deader was well conceived, well thought out, solid script. Uh, you know, Rick Bota knew exactly what he was doing. When we got to Hellworld, Rick was a bit like, let's, you know, let's shoot the days and we'll get through it, and, uh, you know, we'll uh, hopefully it'll all work out in the wash. Uh, well, it didn't, and you can totally tell the haphazard way of making it. I was so disappointed by Hellworld, because it has Lance Henriksen, who I'm a huge fan of. And at the time, it also had someone who would later become famous, Henry Cavill. 
but when he's done he's going to look like he's kind of been chopped up and sewn together. The important thing here is that we can still recognize the beautiful pictures of Mr. Cavill. Lovely Henry, yeah. And, and what a waste, what a waste of talent to have in that, not just the talent, but like what a waste of franchise, of Hellraiser, to make like this meta drivel bullcrap. I know, but look, here's the deal. Let me let me just say something about Lance, right? And I'm a friend of Lance. And I'm going to speak. I don't think Lance is going to say anything. I'm going to say anything at Lance. I think if Lance was sitting here now, he'd watch me say it and he'd laugh and giggle with me and go, no, you're exactly. Lance, was, at that point, was an actor that if you had $200,000, you could get Lance in a film. And if I said to Lance, hey, Lance, what did you think about doing it? Oh, he'd go, I don't fucking know. I don't, I don't remember anything about it. I had some lines and I came in and said them and that was it. You know, I turned up and did my job and went home. I didn't fucking care. At that point, I needed to pay a bill and they gave me some money and I did it. You know, I don't think Lance sat there and said, mm, is this right for my career? I think Lance was like, if you got my, if you could pay my fee, then you've got me. You know, and I think Rick enjoyed working with Lance and I love Lance. He's a lovely guy. I've done several films with him and trust me, I've had some of the best days of my life sitting in hotel bars whilst Lance has gone through everything from Bishop to omen too you know and just talked about his career and lovely lovely guy but he'd sit here with a cigarette in his mouth right now saying oh, I, don't fucking, I don't fucking remember anything about that movie some weird dude with pins in his head was there at one point you know but i mean i just showed up and you know um lance is one of those actors who does so much work he turns up he's a pro he reads he reads his lines does his job and out he goes out and that's it and if the film happens to be a success it's you know it's it's because of the sum of all the parts, not because of Lance. So Rick was lucky to have Lance, but um, it was not a good film going to make. Because honestly, the blueprint for the house wasn't, it wasn't finished. It wasn't ready. That film needed to be made six months later, you know, and deserved a better script and deserved, you know, Carl who wrote it was like coming up with ideas on the fly and trying to come up with stuff. It was all just kind of cobbled together. Um, you know, Henry and, and the kids, you know, who played the, uh, the teens, you know, all fine young actors. I mean, you talk about Henry becoming famous, yeah. But Catherine Winnick's very famous now as well. Oh, yeah, she was in it. I'd forgotten about that. She's brilliant. She's in Vikings, yeah, yeah. you know. And, she, and, and she's a lovely person. One of the nicest people I've ever worked with. Anna Tolpert was very nice. Carrie Payton. I mean, a lovely bunch of kids who all came and were very, really, really excited. I mean, Henry was this big, smiley, lovely kid who, uh, you know, who was like, you know, I, I, I was almost... a. Uh, Superman in Superman Returns, you know, just a smiley, happy-go-lucky guy, and they were excited to be in Romania, and it was freezing cold, and there was this, you know, wizened old Lance who was in the, you know, the the casino every night spending his money, and it was a it was a fun time as a as a as a movie, you know, as a part of a crew, uh, because we were staying at this beautiful hotel, and it was it was all great fun, but as a as a Hellraiser aficionado. I was basically sitting on the sides going, this is, this is garbage. This is utter garbage. And, uh, you know, and, and what a waste. And fundamentally, I have to tell you, that was without doubt the absolute power reason why when I came back from Hellworld with my head hung down and said to my guys, you know, God, I just can't believe this. Like, you know, I'm never going to get a chance to direct one of these. Who knows what they'll do after this if they'll even make one. Uh, I'm never going to get a chance to do anything. And uh, it's such a shame. I think I can make something so much more interesting. And either Mike or Claire said, well, why don't you? Why don't you do something? And I was like, what do you mean? They're like, well, do something. Don't just talk about it. Do it. And I went home that weekend very early on and, and, and wrote a short and said, I think I could probably, you know, scrounge together enough money to do a little short and, and came up with the idea for No More Souls. If you like this video, then please hit that subscribe button. Due to recent changes made by YouTube, we also encourage all of our subscribers, both new and old, to please hit that bell icon next to the subscribe button as well, so you will be notified when new videos are uploaded. Be sure to check back for news and analysis of the happenings and corporate politics behind the scenes of your favorite genre movies, as well as explorations of your favorite characters and their backgrounds and context here at Midnight's Edge.